In the studio, I've got Neville Chester from Coronation Fund Managers. Neville, always a pleasure to speak to you in person. Thank you. I'm sorry about the uncertainty in the market at the moment. It's uh, again, we're starting to mm. feel that a little bit of panic in the system. We've clearly, as I've said over and over again today, got a risk off trade at play. You can see that in the dollar rand. We're mm. at around about that 8.30 level. And of course, equities across the board continuing to, to sell off, although the JSC was slightly stronger today. Yeah. It's going to be topsy-turvy for a while, isn't it? Uh, it's going to be, I think, until we see some kind of resolution in Europe. Um, you know, if you remember at the back end of last year, markets sold off quite a bit when there was a lot of debate around whether Greece was going to exit the euro or not. Uh, then into the beginning of this year, we had quite a nice rally where risk assets all did quite well uh, with the, the LTRO facility, which basically uh, bailed out the banks in Europe. Um, but now, just post the Greek elections, once again, uh, you know, no government's actually been formed. Um, and, and once again, markets thrown into turmoil. I think, you know, as a long-term investor, I think you know there's there's a couple of key points. The first is Greece is actually very small. If you look at the size of the Greek economy and the size of the debt that's out there, uh, you know, the actual impact of Greece, for example, leaving the euro isn't that big. What people are more concerned about is the knock-on effect and the potential. Well, who's next? And don't forget that Spanish mm. bond yields, that ten-year bond yield ticked up significantly mm. again today. It's holding above that mm. 6.5% That's right. Level. I mean, the Spanish economy is much, much bigger and the amount of debt outstanding is much bigger. And that is a real concern. That said, if you look at the, the metrics of the Spanish economy, it's nowhere near as bad as the Greeks. So um, it, it is a little bit of a crisis of confidence, almost self-fulfilling in that you know, if, if, you know, if Spanish bond yields continue rising, then they are in trouble. If Spanish bond yields can get down, then actually the, the situation is not nearly as bad as, as some of the other European countries. You've obviously played out the scenarios as to how they could mm. unfold in your head as much as one can. Do you expect a breakup of the mm. Eurozone or in, in your mind is that mm. improbable? Look, that, a breakup means a lot of things to a lot of people. And I mean, it's, it's probably the, the most heavily debated topic at Coronation at the moment and, and with many different viewpoints. And, as you always said, there's, there's a lot brighter people out there than us trying to grapple with this. Um, the, the base view is I believe the euro will continue. I think there's, there's far too much vested interest and, and there's far too much uh, you know, potential damage that would happen to the economies. I think people don't really understand or appreciate the magnitude of, of what will happen to the economy should they leave the euro. Um, you know, there is a possibility that Greece will leave, but I think the rest of the countries will stay in, in, in the, the common currency block. Um, and I mean, we're seeing that, that already taking place in the Greek economy, where you're seeing that the, um, the Greek banks already uh, facing a run on, on their deposits, people trying to get their money out of the Greek banks. You know, it's only it's just 700 started. million euros withdrawn since May the 6th from the Greek banks specifically. That was that's a stat right. put out there today. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the, uh, the ECB has come out and said that, you know, they're not going to, to fund the shortfall clearly because of, you know, the political positions that a number of the Greek politicians are taking, which is, you know, they, they're not going to comply with, uh, with the agreed bailout package. Um, and so it's rightly so that the ECB says, well, if you want to paddle your own canoe, don't expect us to, to come and help. Well, let's bring it home. Mm. Let's talk about the Coronation Top 20 Fund. It's an award-winning fund. You've done very well. You've got great traction in that space. You've got some significant plays, and mm. I see MTN is uh, your largest holding. That's right. Interesting, because there's also been a lot of debate around MTN, given the situation with uh, Turkcell, Iran. Mm. Mm. A lot of people saying that this could be reputational damage that MTN won't recover from. I'm assuming that you've used this negative news flow to accumulate your position in MTN. Would I be right in that assumption? You're right. Um, it, it was a position we held in the fund pre that, that news, um, but we have increased it um, with, with the sell-off that we've seen. Um, you, you need to understand, I mean, we've done quite a bit of work around that. Obviously, um, the MTN, the company itself, has, has got its Hoffman Commission, which is investigating those um, allegations. Uh, we've looked at the documents that Turkcell's filed. Um, and and there's, there's nothing there that we've seen that, that we believe uh, supports the claims that they are making. Um, and ultimately, this is a business which is very geographically diversified. It operates in a lot of countries. Um, and a lot of those com countries are, are risky countries. Let's face it, you know, if you look at the, the, the big countries they operate in, Nigeria, Syria, Iran, a lot of other African countries, political risk is very high in them. Um, and th we price that into to how we value the company, which is, you know, we don't pay the same kind of multiple that we would for, for operating in a first world country. Um, and even with those layers of conservatism built in, we think there's still quite a lot of value 
um, in NMT and at this current price. It trades on a 7%, close to a 7% forward dividend yield. Uh, they mentioned in their recent results that they're buying back shares. So, you know, if you look at, at, at what they're doing at where they see value, uh, we think it's, 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 a, it's a great business to own. Sassel's also a significant holding, mm. and this is perhaps a, a pet of mine in terms of the discussion point, because mm. yesterday I had Vaughan Henkel from R&B, yeah. Morgan Stanley in studio. Their call has been underweight from the beginning of the year. Sassel, mm -hmm. it's worked very well for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also underweight oil and gas. Yeah. Sassel is the most widely held stock in the South African fund management mm -hmm. universe. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to be exposed to those external elements that have the biggest impacts on its earnings? So yeah. I'm talking about here yeah, the rand dollar price and, of course, the oil price. Oil price. Look, it, it comes back to how Coronation actually invests and analyzes companies. So for us, you know, you don't take spot forecast when, you, when you're valuing Sassel. You don't take, you know, Brent at 109 where it is today and put it in. You need to do a lot of detailed work as to the assumptions as what you think the long run price of oil will be. We don't think it's going to be 109. We actually think it's lower. But ultimately, it's a reflection of total cost of production uh, in order to actually produce oil. Um, and, you know, we look globally at the cost of extraction, the, the, the reducing resources of um, amount of oil in the Middle East, where oil is potentially coming from, the alternative supplies. And so we take a view ultimately on what we think a long-term price for oil is. Um, then we look at the, the kind of production that we think Sassel is going to bring on. And there's some, there's some pretty exciting and interesting ways that they can increase their volumes over time. Um, you know, the gas to liquids uh, that they're, they're talking about in the U.S. in particular, as well as in, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and when we put that together, then with also where we think ultimately the RAND's going to be, we still come out with, with value. So you need to, you know, these are good businesses. Yes, they are reliant on a couple of macro factors, which can move. Um, and we can certainly be wrong in the short term. But we think we've done enough work to understand where the long term oil price should be. And at those levels, we think there's value in, in, in a business like Sassel. Perhaps a little bit more of a, a tricky question. Mm. Do you think that David Constable, the current CEO, can mm. deliver where perhaps Pat Davies disappointed yeah. shareholders? Yeah, look, David does come from more of a project management type background. So we are certainly do, we do have high expectations that he's going to land some of these projects. We've obviously engaged with him quite a bit around a lot of the new areas that they're expanding in, again, particularly talking about those North American shale gas and, and what they're going to do about it um, and, and the kind of returns that we expect to generate from them. You know, if you, if you look at what Sassel's done, I mean, first of all, I mean, Sassel is, you know, a world leader in gas to liquids technology. What they did in Qatar with their plant there, it's never been done anywhere else in the world. So it came on late, it came on over budget, but it actually, it's, it's the only or it's the major GTL plant in the world. So there's a lot of learnings and school fees, I think, that, you know, have been paid within the group. Um, and certainly, I think going forward, we expect that the projects to to uh, be better managed or, or to you know uh, have the benefit of of having done it before. Just looking at your top holdings, you've got significant exposure to both Anglo American and BHP Billiton, mm -hmm. and one would then assume that if I put the hard landing, soft landing debate yeah. around China, you definitely in the soft landing camp. <laughs> would that be a fundamental assumption, or yeah. am I completely wrong? No, that's, that's fair to say. Again, I mean, we don't look at themes. We, we try and understand, you know, we're not going to make a view on, you know, where next quarter's GDP is going to be in China. Um, it does come back to long-term fundamentals. Uh, what we do think is that the market's pricing in a very negative case for, for commodities. Uh, you know, if you look at, at, at the share prices of, of an Anglos or an Abilitin at the moment, um, you know, those share prices have come down significantly. The RAND has weakened quite a bit. Um, you know, that's a big driver for them, as well as the fact that uh, we think commodity prices, even at these levels, so I was just looking at some numbers uh, this evening, you know, Anglos is currently trading on about seven and a half times forward earnings. Uh, we think it's probably about 10 times normal, so we do expect commodity prices to come down. But at 10 times normal for a business of the quality of Anglos, we think that's, that's very cheap. Um, yeah. Can I push you on this one? If I was, yes. if you had to choose between, mm -hmm. if you could only hold one of mm -hmm. the big diversifieds, would it be BHP or would it be Anglo-American? It would be Anglo-American. You'll see in the fund it is, it is a much bigger position. I think we're just over 9% in Anglos. Um, and you know, Anglos has suffered uh, with the view of the market that it is a slightly lower quality uh, business than BHP Billiton, which we would disagree with. Um, it's certainly got some different commodities exposure. BHP is more exposed to oil. Um, whereas uh, Anglo's has, has got more precious, the platinum and diamonds. Um, and, you know, we think we've, we like the, 
the, the recent moves from Anglos where instead of going out and trying to start new greenfields operations, they've actually bought assets that they know. So we think the De Beers deal was, was you know, the right kind of deal to do. Rather buy the rest of an asset that you're operating already, you know your returns or what you're likely to get from it. We think you know, diamonds are a nice light, late cycle um, uh, commodity. So, I mean, if you are looking at, you know, the demand that's coming out of the East, et cetera, uh, it's something that comes after the big base and bulk metals. So w I would say Anglos is, is certainly our preferred. I need to touch on NASPASS as well, yes. because that's another hot debate. Mm. Uh, around 462 Rand, that's yeah. currently where it's trading. Yeah. The argument, as you know well, is that uh, uh, Tencent mm -hmm. is too, hi too highly priced, effectively. Yeah. Yeah and that there's probably blue sky built into that side of the mm, business. Mm. This is not obviously what you believe. No, it is actually. We do think Tencent is uh, overvalued in the price it trades at in Hong Kong. So currently it's about 230 Hong Kong dollars. Uh, we'd certainly think it's more likely somewhere in the hundreds and fifty, hundred and eighty dollars, probably fair value. Where we see the big opportunities and a lot of the other assets that sit inside NASPERS. So the market tends to focus on Tencent too much to the, you know, ignoring a lot of the other assets which are fantastic. So, uh, you know, we think the pay TV business in South Africa and the rest of the African continent is very much underappreciated. Uh, if you look at, you know, B Sky B, for example, in the UK, um, and, and the quality of the earnings that you can generate from a pay TV business um, and very strong cash flows, we think that's a high quality asset. And then there's a lot of other internet assets inside uh, NASPERS that you know, the market's giving them very little credit for. And while I mean the nature of technology investments is that you know not all of them pan out, um, as we've seen with those that do, you know the kind of value accretion that can take place is enormous. So um, you know they they have listed their stake in Mail.ru, um, which is the the Russian uh, internet business. They've got a, a, a large business uh, in Eastern Europe called Traders. It's in um, Turkey. It's across the whole of, of Eastern Europe. It's based mainly in Poland, but has expanded and they bought something recently in Turkey. Um, and then they, they also, a couple of years ago, bought a large uh, internet business in South America, uh, currently not you know, generating any profits, um, but they're investing heavenly. Um, as you know, in a lot of these tech businesses, it's, you know, it's about investing, getting the market, getting the, the community, um, and there afterwards you look at monetizing it. In the South African space, there are a number of CEOs that, that stand out, hmm. that you've got to back. They're almost demigods. Chris Becker is one of those men. How much of the NASPAS story, in your opinion, mm. is about Chris Becker? Look, Chris is without a doubt very important. But I mean, you know, again, you talk about you know good CEOs. You know, one of the key hallmarks of good CEOs is they surround themselves with good people. Um, you know, a, a weak or a poor CEO surrounds himself with weak people because he feels threatened. Good CEOs have have good, strong people around him, and you know, this is a classic case. And without a doubt, I mean, take nothing away from Chris. He's been a visionary. Um, and you know, but there's there's a very strong support team around him, um, and you know, uh, I think a lot of the business, the, the businesses, the building blocks are in place. You know, they haven't been making uh, significant acquisitions recently. If you look at a lot of the value that's actually been derived out of NASPERS, it's out of investments that have been made, you know, five, ten years ago. We're running out of time. We've got time for just one more stock, mm. and that is Mondi. Yes. We've spoken about this before as we drill mm. down into your portfolio, mm. and I'm not going to throw the old adage, the paper industry is a dying one, yeah. etc. So Mondi's got its model right. Mm. Perhaps where Sappy hasn't. Yeah. Look, Mondi, and I mean, you know, the first response to that is Mondi's more of a packaging business than a paper business. If you look at the area of paper that they're in, it's um, basically the printing paper, the stuff that you put in your photocopier and your uh, you know, fax machine. Um, and if you look at the demand for that, if anything, you know, the paperless office is still a dream. We drown in reams of paper every day of that kind. Well, look at, look at the desk, <laughs> a laptop, but um, I, I revert to the 10 pages Exactly, or people like to scribble and mark up. Um, the paper where SAPI has been more exposed to, which has been struggling, has been your glossy, you know, annual reports, magazines, etc., where there has been pressure. Um, but most of the, the pulp and uh, you know, the fiber that, that Mondi produces actually goes into packaging. So it's much more related to uh, you know, commercial activity transactions. Um, and what Mondi has done extremely well over the last few years um, has been positioned themselves right at the bottom of the cost curve. So you can be in an industry which overall is not making money or losing money, but they're actually in a great position because they're at the, right at the bottom of the cost curve. So even though their competitors aren't making money, they do. And the good news for that is that keeps prices up because you know, if, if the prices don't stay up, half, your, half the supply is going to go out of business.